Good morning, and welcome to our Sunday service. Uh, we have an interesting program today that will be quite controversial, and many congregations wouldn't even think of addressing this situation, but the Unitarians address everything, and so... <laughs> We're going to have three speakers today, and then after the three speakers, we will have the offering, and at the offering, uh, you may uh, donate three different ways. You can, we will pass the plate, or you may, there's a QR code on a little, that Mark's holding up right now. If you look at the bench in front of you, you will see a little plastic thing with um, a QR code on it, you, you may donate there. Or if you're at home, you may push the donate button on your uh, screen and donate that way. And during the donation, we're going to have the music of David Owens. We're very grateful that he has uh, consented to play during our, our offering. And you can greet your neighbors. Please find out who they are, and welcome to everybody. Our exciting program today, we are dealing with ways to achieve a peaceful and just future between the Palestinians and the Israelis. Although the majority of Jews and Americans stand by Israel, no matter what she does, there are a few Jewish groups and some Americans who look at the situation objectively and try to get the news from other sources. And um, we believe that Israel is committing human rights abuses in the occupied territories of Jerusalem. And uh, we have three objective speakers today. The first one is Matthew Weinstein, who grew up in Baltimore and now lives in Salt Lake and is a leader of J Street in Utah which is a pro-Israel, pro-peace organization dedicated to electing candidates to the U.S. Congress who will promote policies that will lead to peace between the Palestinians and Israelis. He's visited Israel 10 times, including three times when he stayed for over a year. Our second speaker is Rabbi Lynn Gottlieb, and she's a member of the Rabbinic Council of Jewish Voice for Peace, which is a grassroots organization inspired by the Jewish tradition to work for a just and lasting peace and human rights for the people of Israel and Palestine. And she will join us on Zoom from her home in Berkeley, California. And our third speaker is Nora Abudan of Palestinian Heritage. She's the co-founder and the CEO of the Emerald Project, which is an organization dedicated to combating the misrepresentation of Islam. And uh, she lives in Salt Lake. Palestinians have lived under a harsh occupation for more than 50 years. Think of the French occupation of World War II that lasted five years. And then imagine living under occupation, under military rule for your entire life. Our speakers will differ on some of the major issues. You will hear that they have different takes on BDS, which stands for Boycott, Divest, and Sanction Israel. This is a nonviolent way to approach justice. But 30 states, including Utah, have ruled it illegal to boycott Israel. BDS worked with South Africa, and it's working in the Middle East. But now, 30 states will not allow it to take place. I have an anecdote for you. A Kansas school teacher was told that she had to sign a pledge saying that she would not boycott Israel in order to keep her job. Be, they, they did this because there's a law in Kansas that you can't boycott Israel. She refused to do this, and the ACLU represented her in court, and she won her case in the Kansas Supreme Court because the right to boycott is protected by the First Amendment. Notice that our speakers will differ, differ on another big issue, whether there should be a one-state or a two-state solution. Would it be best to have one democratic country with equal rights for all, meaning that Jews wouldn't get special preference, or two separate countries, Israel and Palestine, standing side by side. 
You will hear that five international groups, including the UN and Amnesty International, have called Israel an apartheid state. Just this week, the Israeli Supreme Court made it legal to commit ethnic cleansing on Palestinian land. This goes against the UN Charter, it goes against international law, and it goes against the Fourth Geneva Convention. Another problem is there are 40 million evangelical Christians who wield a lot of power and who believe that the rapture will take place in Israel. They are on Israel's side in the conflict because they believe God gave Abraham the land in the Bible. Christian Zionism is a major problem. Another problem is the U.S. government provides Israel over $4 billion a year as part of our own militarism and global projects. The State Department, Congress, President Biden, and the media are all firmly on Israel's side. You need to read international newspapers like The Guardian if you're going to get a clear picture of what's really going on. For instance, in the media, Israel is portrayed as the victim and the Palestinians are portrayed as terrorists. If you believe that that's the simple answer, you would be wrong. Out of 100 people killed in the conflict, 98 of them are Palestinians and two are Israelis. With that, let's begin with Matthew. So I thought what I could do uh, is first tell you a little bit about myself um, my, you know, personal story. Uh, Paul was asking me, how did you get involved in this? So I thought I could uh, share that. Uh, and then uh, tell you about J Street and what J Street does. Um, and then maybe get into some of the controversial issues like BDS and so forth if there's time, or maybe save that for the Q&A. So uh, first of all, my story. So as uh, Barbara said, I grew up uh, in Baltimore. Uh, and um, first came to this issue at my uh, Orthodox uh, Jewish uh, day school in Baltimore. I had an interesting upbringing where my parents were members of, of a reform synagogue, which is on the left side of the Jewish religious spectrum, but sent me to an Orthodox day school, which is more on the right side of the spectrum. So I got a probably broader view than many get of uh, sort of all the different uh, forms of Jewish religious expression. And uh, uh, in middle school at some point, my English class, we were assigned a unit on debate. And I was assigned to argue the proposition, uh, this was in the 1970s, uh, that there should be a Palestinian state. The teacher had a knack for picking, you know, the most controversial topics. Uh, and this was, you know, in the 1970s when, uh, you know, the Munich Olympics and uh, all the, you know, the, the, the main word associated in our minds, certainly, with Palestinian was terrorist. Uh, but I emerged from that uh, experience completely convinced that uh, Palestinian statehood was the only uh, way to achieve peace and injustice. Uh, between uh, Jews and Arabs, between Israelis and Palestinians. And, uh, and I've been an activist uh, on that issue ever since, um, which has positioned me oftentimes against, uh, as Barbara was describing, the kind of Jewish mainstream and groups like AIPAC, uh, the American Israel Public Affairs Committee that purports to speak for the American Jewish community but is moved so far to the right uh, in recent decades, which I uh, first ran into when I went, uh, I went to live in Israel uh, for a year and a half uh, during the first intifada. Uh, I actually arrived like 10 days after the first intifada started in December of 1987. Um, and, uh, found myself, you know, during that time going to peace rallies and traveling to uh, uh, Hebron and other parts of the occupied West Bank on, you know, solidarity visits and dialogue uh, visits with uh, Palestinians. And um, uh, uh, came back then, and, and well, I spent a year and a half uh, essentially living in a right-wing Israeli town made up of mostly Moroccan and Yemenite 
uh, uh, Israelis, Jewish Israelis who had come from the Arab world and who tended to make up the base of the right wing and of the Likud party, which was in power at the time. And it was an election year in Israel, and I was just find, found myself arguing constantly, uh, and it was great for developing my Hebrew vocabulary uh, about politics and why uh, Israelis should support Palestinian statehood in the West Bank and Gaza and end the occupation and stop the settlements. Um, and it was always interesting to me that one of the, the, where we would end up in many cases in the argument was the Israeli would say to me in the end, well, in the end the U.S. will tell us what to do and we'll do it. <laughs> and, and that was a real kind of wake up to me uh, that not only, you know, might we as Americans think that America has a role to play there, but even Israelis kind of expected uh, that America was going to kind of rescue them in the end from this endless conflict. And uh, I came back to the United States and, you know, began writing and speaking and advocating mainly within the Jewish community uh, on that issue and in support of a strong American role. Uh, represented the group Peace Now, uh, which is whether there's an American affiliate of the Israeli peace group uh, called Americans for Peace Now, who I represented at the Baltimore Jewish Council in the 1990s. Um, and then went back, uh, spent another uh, year in Israel working on my bachelor's degree at the University of Haifa, which was an interesting experience because University of Haifa has something like 20, 30 percent uh, Arab Israeli, Palestinian Israeli students and, you know, did solidarity work with them in support of their free speech rights, which were not always uh, protected uh, by the university when they would have a protest or something like that. Um, and that was a time when, at the end of that, there was the whole Gulf War going on and the Scud missiles, um, which we can, you know, get into later, possibly, but the, the, um, one of the most interesting things to come out of that experience for me was, uh, that it, at that point, uh, 1991, Israel was requesting U.S. aid. $10 billion in loan guarantees, in addition to the regular military aid that the U.S. provides to Israel. And uh, the president at the time, uh, who I was not a fan of generally, President George H.W. Bush, uh, was saying that he was not going to permit these loan guarantees to go ahead unless Israel stopped expanding settlements in the West Bank. And the Israeli prime minister at the time, Yitzhak Shamir, from the Likud party, was a hardline right winger who later revealed that his plan was to string the Americans along while he kept expanding settlements until it would make a two-state solution physically and politically impossible. Um, but George H.W. Bush stuck to his guns and won in the end uh, and sent a powerful message uh, to Israeli voters so that in the election the next year, uh, they realized that Shamir and the Likud had lost American support, and they voted for the left. They elected the Labor Party and Yitzhak Rabin, which then led to the Oslo peace process. So that was another important lesson for me in the, the importance of the American role uh, in kind of laying down the law and, and, and saying what the red lines are. Um, and also about the unfortunate role of APAC, because I found myself for my senior year of college back on uh, a co my college campus, uh, having to shut down the effort by APAC uh, to get people to support the loan guarantees. And I instead organized a meeting of students and local rabbis and, and Jewish community members with our member of Congress at the time in Western Massachusetts saying support President George Bush uh, and his effort to, you know, draw a line in the sand and say, you have to stop expanding settlements or you're not going to get this American aid. So that kind of, those were kind of my formative experiences. Uh, so when J Street came along uh, in the, um, uh, I guess a dozen or so years ago, I immediately, you know, jumped on board because they were taking what groups like Peace Now and Americans for Peace Now had done uh, to the next level. They were going to be uh, much more powerful lobbyists and they were going to uh, 
uh, work much more effectively to develop a grassroots base, uh, similar to what APAC has done, but more in a pro-peace direction. And uh, they were going to uh, be political. They were going to endorse candidates and raise money and try to elect uh, candidates who would be pro-peace and who would oppose the occupation and support using America's influence to end the occupation and achieve a two-state solution. So uh, they do that, J Street does that uh, uh, through uh, you know, lobbying Congress. Uh, we had a, you know, uh, 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 for example, a law introduced by Andy Levin, uh, a representative who unfortunately just lost to the APAC back candidate in Michigan uh, called the Two-State Solution Act uh, that uh, was sort of the whole J Street wish list of everything the U.S. should be doing uh, that is the sort of thing that J Street supports. In elections, uh, J Street uh, has, until this year, had a lot of success. This year has been a little rougher. Uh, we focus uh, a lot on the Jewish community and on raising awareness uh, of what's happening in Israel and Palestine. Uh, because uh, Paul was telling me, where did Paul go, that he had visited Bethlehem uh, and seen uh, some of the terrible practices of Israel in the occupation and the impact on Palestinians. Uh, and so many things that are just so arbitrary and unnecessary uh, and that just cause so much uh, so many problems, not to mention the violence and the people killed. Um, it, it's just, it's so important for uh, American Jews who, you know, support Israel in principle to see these abuses and how Israel's gone off the rails in a lot of ways uh, in the West Bank, in the occupation, and how the settlers uh, and the religious extremists have become so powerful within Israel and have become sort of the driving force uh, where there's now something like 100 officially legal settlements, but an even larger number of illegal settlements where you know, a bunch of religious extremists will show up on a hilltop and try to establish a settlement and the Israeli government won't evacuate them. And there's over 100 of those in the West Bank and they're trying to establish facts on the ground to make a two-state solution physically and politically uh, impossible. So J Street works to educate uh, the American Jewish community about that, members of Congress, uh, you know, brings uh, people to on tours. Uh, is re I think J Street is either in the middle of or just concluded uh, a, uh, a member of Congress visit uh, to Israel and Palestine right now. He's doing that a couple of times a year. Uh, I participated in a, a, a J Street visit uh, in 2018, the last time I was there for a, a year, in October of 2018, we went and visited Ramallah, the, which serves as the capital of the Palestinian Authority. Uh, I mean, ultimately, East Jerusalem should be, you know, the Palestinian capital and hopefully will be at some point. Uh, but for now, Ramallah is the uh, uh, headquarters, uh, the, the capital of the Palestinian Authority. Uh, which is the whole arrangement that came about in the 1990s with the Oslo Accords where there's areas A and B that make up about 40% of the West Bank that are mostly controlled by the Palestinians but very fragmented with Israeli roadblocks separating them. Uh, and uh, that's the sort of mini autonomy uh, that the Palestinians uh, have. Um, but with Israel still you know, controlling things like the water uh, and uh, uh, many other things and restricting the ability to move between the different parts of uh, uh, the Palestinian Authority, which is a big problem. Um, so um, uh, we visited Ramallah. We met with Saya Barakat, the main, who was, until he died of COVID, the main Palestinian negotiator. Uh, we met with uh, Mahmoud Abbas, the president of the Palestinian Authority. Uh, and it, it just is extraordinary to me that, uh, you know, liberal American Jews are coming to have these meetings and the leaders of Israel's government are not. And for the last, you know, dozen years uh, under uh, the Likud-led governments of Bibi Netanyahu have not been uh, negotiating and have not been 
uh, taking advantage of the fact that there is uh, a real partner for peace uh, in the West Bank at least, not in Gaza, but at least in the West Bank. Um, so those are the kind of things that J Street does. Some of the biggest victories J Street has had has certainly been in Jewish public opinion, which in the United States still supports a two-state solution. Um, the Iran nuclear deal, which AIPAC opposed, uh, which J Street fought very hard for and won on, at least until Trump uh, pulled out of it in 2018. And now, you know, the Biden administration is trying to get back into it, but that hasn't happened yet. Uh, hopefully it will at some point. Um, uh, J Street opposed unilateral annexation under Prime Minister Netanyahu uh, and had a lot of success on that uh, and on mobilizing American Jewish opposition to that. Uh, J Street's also made progress on getting aid restrictions written into the American appropriations bills uh, so that uh, there's clear limits on what can be done uh, with American aid to Israel. But we've also had a lot of losses this year. Andy Levin being losing his primary uh, last week was a real heartbreaker. Uh, Henry Cuellar versus Jessica Cisneros was another one in Texas uh, where the uh, APAC more conservative Democrat won. And in fact, APAC this year has spent literally millions of dollars, maybe tens of millions, raised from Republicans uh, on democratic primaries opposing the progressive candidates generally, but also on Israel and Palestine. And so that has been very tough, and A Street hasn't developed a great uh, solution for that. Uh, I think I'm just about out of time, maybe another two or three minutes, but let me um, just mention a couple other things. Uh, J Street also, if you go to the jstreet.org website, you can see that we have a whole section uh, that talks about uh, our solidarity with uh, uh, is Israelis and Palestinians on the ground in Israel and Palestine who are working for peace. Uh, folks like, uh, there's a, a group called Standing Together uh, that is uh, Jews and Palestinian Israelis who work together on a variety of issues including uh, promoting peace, Rabbis for Human Rights, uh, Machsom Watch, uh, which is a, a women's peace group uh, I guess a Jewish women's peace group in Israel that uh, uh, focuses on the issue of the roadblocks that Israel operates in the West Bank that restrict Palestinian travel across the Green Line as well as within uh, Palestine and the Palestinian Authority. Uh, I went on one of their tours in 2019. It's a real eye-opener. Uh, there's groups like Combatants for Peace, uh, that bring together uh, Israeli and Palestinian uh, former combatants who are ready to make peace and who uh, do a couple of big events every year uh, that J Street uh, co-sponsors uh, where they've taken the Israeli annual Memorial Day uh, that happens every spring for the Israeli soldiers, a Memorial Day of like the equivalent of ours, and they've turned it into an Israeli-Palestinian joint Memorial Day. Uh, and so I attended that along with probably 10,000 other uh, Israelis when I was there in 2019 for that. You can also tune in online. Uh, that's another great, you know, if, if you, if you want to get a sense of hope that there's a potential for peace, that's uh, one of the events where you can uh, get that sense. Um, uh, okay, and I mentioned the tours. So um, I guess on the, maybe I have enough time to, uh, take one minute to mention BDS. I think that uh, the, the one thing I'll say about BDS is that uh, there are many BDSs. Uh, so Barbara, you know, talked about boycott, divestment, and sanctions, but the, there are different kinds of BDS. Uh, so uh, one kind is the kind supported by the Palestinian uh, 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 a global BDS movement, which is based on the idea of calling for a Palestinian right of return, which means in effect calling for a one-state solution, which is a very different uh, proposed solution from what J Street supports, the two-state solution. And we can maybe get into that later, the you know differences between them and the pluses and minuses of each one. Uh, as opposed to the kind of boycotts uh, where group where companies like Ben and Jerry's and McDonald's and Airbnb 
have attempted to say we're not going to we're going to boycott the settlements uh, in support of a two-state solution. And uh, when that happened last year, when Ben and Jerry's announced they were going to boycott uh, the settlements, um, I immediately wrote an op-ed that was published in uh, the Jewish newspaper in Baltimore, the Baltimore Jewish Times. We don't have a Jewish newspaper here in Utah, or I would have published it there, saying why that was such a great idea and why American Jews should support that and not oppose it. Um, and have lobbied with J Street in support of that uh, in, with the Baltimore Jewish Council uh, to try to get them to back off of uh, their efforts to you know, do what Barbara described that a number of states have done where if uh, Ben and Jerry's boycotts the settlements, not even Israel, just the settlements, uh, they withdraw their pension funds uh, in New York State or Texas, uh, and which we've been able to stop Utah from passing that and uh, hopefully we can continue to. Um, anyway, so that's just a, a little bit of what I've been up to and uh, what J Street does uh, in support of a two-state solution, and maybe we can discuss some of the more details of that during the uh, Q&A. But for now, I'll uh, turn it over to uh, Rabbi Gottlieb. Right. Welcome, Rabbi. Thank you. Um, greeting you here. Salam Aleikum, Shalom Aleichem from Berkeley, California. I'm, I'm sorry I can't be with you. I, I want to begin this morning, first of all, uh, with a lament. Because um, in this moment, Gaza is once again being bombed and there is nowhere to run. And so we can have American conversations or two Jewish people on this panel can have a conversation about uh, whether or not we might support a one or two state solution. But the reality is that Palestinian lives are being taken with impunity. And this with American weapons fired by is Jewish Israelis. Um, and this is part of an ongoing catastrophe which is called and is called Nakba. N A K B A, Nakba, which means catastrophe. And it has been ongoing. And to speak of this conflict without understanding that we are in the midst of an ongoing catastrophe is to ignore a root cause. And it makes Jewish American, Christian American conversations uh, seem normative when Palestinians have never, not in Oslo either, been invited as equitable or full participants to the political table that is imposed upon them by the United States. And so I would like all of you to put your hands on your heart, please, because this is a conversation with a lot of emotion for people who have who are on the front lines of this conflict. In particular, people who whose land has been taken from them. And so this is an atonement uh, lamentation for the sin of ethnic cleansing of 1948 and the forced removal of 750,000 Palestinians from their homes. That is three quarters of the population living there forced removal, forcing them to permanent 
refugee status without citizenship. For the ethnic cleansing in 1967 of 150,000 Palestinians from the West Bank. For ongoing ethnic cleansing of Palestinians throughout the lands of 1948, Jerusalem, and the West Bank, including Sheikh Jarrah, the Southern Hebron Hills, Jerusalem neighborhoods and towns, Mustafa, for internal transfer, for land seizure of farmlands for settlement use, for the fragmentation of Palestinian geography and people, enclosing Palestinian habitations with rings of Jewish settlements, for home demolition of thousands upon thousands of home, Palestinian homes, of moving into Palestinian homes and taking them over, seizure of houses for military purposes, hundreds, thousands of arbitrary military orders, imposition of Jewish only bypass roads, construction of hundreds of miles of separation walls and barrier fences, limitation and hardships imposed on export and import, denial of access to water, deliberate destruction of tens of thousands of olive and fruit bearing trees, the bombing of power and fuel stations and limiting electricity, which is happening right now in Raza. People have four hours of electricity a day, if that. Limiting access to food through closure of borders in Raza, in Gaza. Prevention of access to humanitarian aid in Raza imposition of checkpoints and transfer stations, imposition of security zones in Palestinian towns, dividing towns and villages, humiliation by destruction of personal property, stripping people naked in the street and during interrogation, threatening people with sexual violence, beating, screaming, kicking, slapping, and pitching people by soldiers, eradication of entire families through bombing, curfews, inaccessibility of health care in the form of medicine, equipment, travel permits, education of doctors and nurses, letting people bleed to death in the street after being shot, non-existence of legal recourse, ongoing closure and siege, administrative detention, detention centers for African refugees, imprisonment of hundreds of children, torture of prisoners and people held in captivity, shoot to kill orders, targeted assassination, nightly military incursions, use of human shields to enter Palestinian houses, discriminatory zoning and planning, refusal to pick up garbage, forced family separation, systemic destruction of public infrastructure, a policy of impunity for acts of settler and soldier violence, air assault and massive ground invasion, torture by sonic boom in Gaza, limitation on access to the sea by fishing, use of rubber bullets and other deadly forms of crowd control, withholding Palestinian taxpayer money from the PA, imprisoning elected officials, imposing a system of Israeli propaganda, criminalizing BDS and other nonviolent resistant tactics. BDS is the same. It has many spectrums. Targeting journalists, denial of entry into Israel to Palestinians trying to visit family, creation of refugees who are stateless and without a right of return, a never ending assault resulting in inter intergenerational trauma, criminalizing of the narrative of Palestinian liberation, the hubris, the hubris of talking about peace without Palestinian political right to be at their own table for these abrogations of human rights carried out 
on a daily and minute to minute basis, I pledge my solidarity until healing is complete. Nakba is ongoing and the United States is deeply implicated for funding. And it is fairly meaningless to talk about right wing settlers as if they're the problem when every single government in Israel is built on the basis of the things that I mentioned. And there are a million Jewish people living in the West Bank. So one cannot address this issue without talking about Nakba. And that is for the Unitarian Universalists to learn about. Second, I want to say the right to boycott is widely accepted in Palestinian society as the agreed upon method, as it was in South Africa, to use economic pressure, which is mostly symbolic, to bring to attention the right to end military occupation and the right to return, which the Jews, Jewish people claim for themselves, <laughs> the right to return. So that the idea that, that people cannot live together is what's underneath the denial of the right of return, but Palestinians and Jews already live together, mostly in peace, in where they are allowed to do so. And therefore the right of return is an international right, and I support it. Thirdly, I want to say that it is important that you center Palestinian voices. And I, I'm so glad uh, that Nora is here. That was at my urge, because we cannot have a conversation without centering Palestinian voices. It would be like white people getting together and having all the solutions for racism and, and, and maybe saying how bad it is without, without allowing or giving um, or stepping back is my, maybe the right word uh, for, for black uh, Americans to define the issue, to tell their stories, and to create the tactics of resistance. Because until we understand systemic harm and that people with privilege are part of the problem, we can never create a solution for the future. So centering Palestinian voices is critical. And finally, I wanna say that it's good to inform yourself, but you have to take action because otherwise all the emotional trauma of asking people to speak uh, about this issue, uh, asking Palestinian people to speak about this issue and educate you uh, is even more painful if it fall, if, if, if people feel bad about it, but they don't take action. So, um, you know, I'm, I've, been, I've been part of the solidarity, Palestine solidarity movement since 1966. That's 50 years. You know, I'm the co-founder of the Fellowship of Reconciliations Interfaith Peace Builder, which is now Eyewitness Palestine. Don't go with a Jewish group. <laughs> go with a, a Palestinian group that is leading you. Palestinian, even tourism to uh, the West Bank is, is controlled mostly by Jewish groups and Israelis. So if you want to help Palestinian economy and help people survive the incredibly difficult economic context of their lives in the West Bank and, to, and, and Gaza, which, which is beyond, uh, you know, Gaza is running out of water. There's the, but in the West Bank, if you go there, 
um, go with eyewitness Palestine and be led by Palestinians and work in your own denomination. You have work to do in your own denomination to promote a boycott campaign, whatever that might be. And uh, having worked for years with the Presbyterians and the Episcopalians myself and, and others um, in my community of Jewish Voice for Peace, divestment is a very good place to start it, depending on where your own pension funds are invested. And uh, another piece is you can become part of the deadly exchange campaign work. Deadly exchange is the way that U.S. Um, police are taken to Israel and there's a kind of alliance It builds on the U.S.-Israel military alliance that will prevent any kind of peacemaking except very modest um, and ephemeral um, reforms. Obviously the settlements are ongoing. Um, so get involved, uh, get involved and um, be very sensitive about your own racism if you are not a Palestinian. Um, do that homework, please. Um, because Palestinian rights should be at the center of our concerns because um, it is the longest military occupation and genocide by attrition that is happening uh, in the world right now. And if you don't like the word genocide, then call your senator and your representatives today and call for an end to military aid to Israel and to open the gates of Raza, let people live. I, for one, am not afraid of Palestinian neighbors. And that is why I support a collective unified <coughs> solution or possibility of a future that will bring peace and equity, equity, and peace. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, everyone, and good morning. Thank you so much for having me here today. Um, I know I have to speak for 15 minutes, so please bear with me. It's a um, little bit challenging today, this past week, the past 74 years. <laughs> um, first of all, I'd like to acknowledge that I am on stolen land, which is ironic because I'm here in this country because my family's land was stolen. But I think it's important to know that even us here is a privilege and that this land is not originally ours and it belongs to the indigenous people. I want to thank Barbara Taylor for inviting me to speak. She reached out months ago. And at first, I was like, why is a non-Palestinian reaching out to talk about Palestine? <laughs> but that just shows everyone who empathizes and is an ally, their dedication. Um, I don't know who's more angry at the occupation, myself or Paul. We were chatting before the panel, and he has been to Palestine, and he was sharing some of his stories. Maybe a lot of you have gone as well and seen it firsthand, or you know Palestinians, or you're well-educated on the matter, which most of you seem like you are. Um, this is not the first time that I've spoken at this beautiful church. Uh, you had Satine and I from the Emerald Project a few years ago. Tim, I think you facilitated that. So I just want to thank you again for having me here, being welcoming, and being willing to have these conversations. And I, I can't thank you enough, Barbara. Oh, thank you for coming. Yeah, thank you. Um, 
it's always so impressive to me when people who don't look like me or aren't Palestinian or believe what I believe still want to have a conversation and still show their support and come with an open mind and an open heart. Um, so I was asked to speak for 15 minutes about the occupation and what I felt was important. As you can see, that's a little bit of a time crunch. There's no way I can fit in everything in 15 minutes. Um, I also want you to know that I am open for conversations in the future. I also have other resources. I'm by no means all inclusive of what all Palestinians think. I don't know every single thing about Palestine or what's going on, but I say that because your voices matter. I don't want anyone to ever think because you haven't been there or because you're not Palestinian that you cannot speak on these matters. You can speak with your family, you can speak with your friends, you can speak with your colleagues, you can speak with whoever you want and who's willing to have a conversation. Don't feel like you can't speak on behalf of a Palestinian. Of course, we have our own stories and our own voices, but you can be an advocate as well. Sometimes people feel like, oh, well, that's not my lived experience, so maybe I should remain silent, even though I don't agree with what's happening. That's the biggest mistake you can make, is not taking action, like Rabbi Lynn said. That is the biggest mistake you can make. Have those conversations. Engage in dialogue of those willing to listen, but I'll tell you, there's some people who don't wanna have a conversation and who aren't willing to listen and educate themselves, and that's okay. You don't have to expend your energy on those people or those conversations. There are plenty more in their place where they do want to listen and they are receptive. So a lot of you might have already watched the video that was sent yesterday. Um, it was through Amnesty International. It was a 14 minute explanation video on the occupation and I think they did a pretty good job with it. Um, it's kind of mind blowing because I feel like just a couple of years ago, if I said genocide, occupation, military rule, people would look at me sideways most of the time and they're like, what do you mean Israel is an apartheid state? What do you mean there's a genocide against Palestinians? But the fact that people are even talking about it or these quote unquote credible organizations are finally calling a cow a cow is long overdue, but I'm still happy that there's progress. I do see the needle moving. A lot of times I feel helpless and I feel like we're just in the cycle of, okay, when's the next uproar? When's the next bombings? And unfortunately, it's happening actually this week. As Rabbi Lynn mentioned before, Gaza is the biggest open air prison. It is one of the most densely populated areas in the world. There's two million people living there in small quarters with nowhere to run, with nowhere to go. And the reason why usually the Israeli government targets them and bombs them is because they know only Gazans are there. They're not concerned with accidentally hitting an Israeli settlement or Israelis. And a lot of times people also ask me, what does the occupation have to do with us, us Americans, right? That's happening all the way on the other side of the globe. A lot of you might be educated on the matter, but something that you can bring up is our tax dollars are involved. $1.3 billion goes to Israel. I don't know about you, but that's a lot of tax dollars. That's a lot of money. Do you guys know that in Israel, healthcare is free? Here in the United States, healthcare is not free, but we are funding their free healthcare. We are funding their weaponry, the bombs that they're using to kill people who look like me. And for all of you here, I feel like you have a deep sense of morality and values that that is not okay, especially with your tax dollars. And that is a big point that you can bring up to people. Um, another thing too, and this is to speak on the occupation, I feel one of the most discrediting or invalidating things as a Palestinian is a lot of times when other catastrophes are happening in the globe, and there are many, unfortunately, it's not just Palestine, but when other things are happening, people are more quickly to acknowledge what in fact is going on, but when it comes to Palestine, all of a sudden they're unsure. It's it's a complicated situation. It's been going on for so long. I have people who tell me it's been going on for hundreds of years. 
I'm not going to call anyone out specifically, but please raise your hand if you were born before 1948 or know someone who was born before 1948. <laughs> I'm not going to ask you if it's you or someone you know. Um, but that just proves that there are some living beings on this earth who have lived before the state of Israel and the occupation. But people don't think that. They think, oh, it's just the Middle East. They've been doing this since time immemorial, and that's not the case. Sometimes when you bring that up and you say, you know, the Titanic happened before the occupation, <laughs> some people might be surprised to hear that. So definitely put things in perspective. Um, but circling back to what I was saying, even with Russia and Ukraine, I felt devastated for the Ukrainian people. I did, but what broke my heart is that even here in Utah, I, said, I saw so many billboards everywhere. We stand with Ukraine. Pray for Ukraine. The Ukrainian people are brave. They're heroes. Look at them fighting for their country fighting against the powerful Russians, us condemning the Russians. And I don't know who made this paper. Was this you, Barbara? Of course it was. <laughs> <laughs> but if you look at the parallelism here, but what we say about Ukraine and what we say about the Palestinian people, it's night and day. There was actually a picture that was circulating it was a young girl and she was standing up to a tank, like a military tank. And I remember seeing this image on social media and they were saying, what a brave Ukrainian girl fighting for her country. Look how young she is standing up to this military tank. That was a picture of a young woman fighting in Palestine. She was standing up to an Israeli tank. But all of a sudden, now that someone thinks it's a young woman defending Ukraine or for defending her country, she's a hero. She's so brave. But when it's us, we're deemed terrorist. And that is something that is completely unacceptable and needs to be talked about. The Ukrainian people are going through something so absolutely catastrophic and devastating, but the Palestinians are no different. And even when you hear the news, oh, these people, they're blonde, they're blue-eyed. We have some blonde, blue-eyed people too in Palestine, if that makes you feel better, if that makes you want to stand up with us. But it's just mind-blowing. Like, I, I don't want to believe these things are true, but I have seen them and I have heard them firsthand. And it's time for us to speak up and educate people. Some people are truly ignorant. They don't do it out of maliciousness. But this is a primary example of something that we can bring up. Um, something else, too, that the U.S. is involved in, as you know, there's lobbyist groups. I know Matthew spoke about APAC. Basically, you have to kiss the APAC ring before you want to be president or you want to run for big positions of power in this government. So when people approach me and they say, well, it's not our problem or this doesn't involve us, it does. Your tax dollars... And people were really struggling during COVID. People are still struggling, but why were we sending aid and billions of dollars to Israel when we could have kept that money here for our people? Healthcare workers, nurses were begging for relief for COVID, but we were sending our money elsewhere. And while I am Palestinian, I am also American. I was born here in Utah. And to me, it is not moral or part of my American values to have my money, my tax dollars, my hard-earned money go to funding a genocide. Um, I'll move on from this and we can have a Q&A after. And again, this is an ongoing conversation. This is not something we can just cover in 15 minutes, but I'm so, so thankful for the space and the time to even have a platform to speak. Um, the next thing is I wanna share um, a couple of stories or I guess situations that should probably be in the forefront of your mind. Um, as you know, back in May, Shireen Abu Akla was murdered by Israeli forces. 
And I know there was this whole investigation of like, oh, you know, maybe what was funny to me is that even the Israeli side said, oh, um, it must have been Palestinian militants. They probably shot her. When she was clearly in a press uniform, she was working for Al Jazeera for over 40 years, and she was an American citizen. Which clearly, as you know, press should be absolutely off limits. But she was targeted and shot four times, I believe, and it was right in her neck area. And it was from 200 meters away. That is not an accident, and there was no conflict going on at that time, as far as between people. Um, another thing I'd like to share too, because I am not the only Palestinian voice, um, a lot of my friends have lived in Palestine. I have never lived there, but I am a byproduct of the genocide of the Nakba. Um, my family lost their home. My dad did when he was about seven years old, and he never got to go back to his home. I'm sure, we visited, but we're, as Paul would put it, we're refugees in our own country. He was born as a refugee in his own country. Um, but my really good friend, Fatma Badran, she lived in Palestine until she was about 13 years old. And funny enough, we were at a wedding yesterday. One of our other Palestinian friends was getting married, and they had um, fireworks at the end. And they came from behind her, so she didn't get to see them, and she didn't know that they were going to be exploding. So... That just about you know, sent her into a panic attack because it reminds her of the bombings in, in Palestine. That is her reality. That is where she grew up, that is where she lived, but she has to deal with that trauma every single day. Another friend of mine, Lena, she's actually studying to be a doctor. I believe she's in her third or fourth year, but um, she is a Ghazan. And while Palestinians are strong and we're fiery, there's nothing like someone from Gaza. If you feel like Palestinians are strong or brave, Gazans are 10 times that. And she, um, she wants to become a doctor so she can actually help aid her people in Palestine, our people, and, and give them aid because there's not a lot of healthcare that is available to them. Um, as you know, there's multiple checkpoints where Palestinians have to go through. They have to be approved for permits to go get medical attention, and a lot of times they die in the process, and they never actually make it past the, the border. But to this day, she still has nightmares every single day. I think one time I asked her, I was like, oh, how did you sleep? You know, I know uh, medical school is a lot, and she's like, I haven't slept for over 10 years. She's like, what is sleep? She just has chronic nightmares. So when we talk about this, it's not something that's light. It's not something that's equal. A lot of times people will say, I wish both sides would just come to the table and agree and have peace. There will never, ever be peace as long as Israel is in control, the Israeli government, the Zionist government, and Palestinians, like Rabbi Lin said, don't have a seat at our own table. We can't have the Israeli government making the decisions for us until we give the land back to the Palestinian people and let them decide what they want to do, there will never be peace. Now, I'm not going to say there aren't any Palestinians who want a two-state solution. At this point, some are just begging for crumbs just to have electricity for more than four hours a day, just to have some drinking water, just to have a job, just to be able to go outside and not have to worry if their life is in danger. But I absolutely support a one-state solution. Give the land back to the Palestinians. If the people who are already living there want to stay there, that's absolutely fine. But let the Palestinians be in control and let Jews, Christians, and Muslims live together. That's another thing, too. A lot of people think that there was nothing in Palestine before the Zionists came in, which is absolutely incorrect. Believe it or not, we had cinemas, we had universities. We were actually civilized people before the Israeli settlers came. A lot of times they say, oh, we civilized the Arabs. We built a society for them. But I urge you, go look for yourself. You don't even have to take my word for it. I brought some resource documents that you can grab after, 
but you can watch documentaries, you can read books. I do believe that the truth resonates and you will see that Palestine existed for over 800 years before our land was stolen. And we had Jews there and we had Christians there and we had Muslims there. So this notion that it's a religious conflict, number one, it's not a conflict, it's a genocide. And no, it's not complicated, it's very simple. And two, we love our Jewish brothers and sisters. So to use us as a tactic to say that's what's going on could be farther from the truth. Lastly, I'll wrap up because I know I'm probably over time. But a lot of you are already probably knowledgeable and educated on this subject, but please take action. I will echo what Rabbi Lynn said. Me speaking today, Matthew speaking today, Rabbi Lynn speaking today means nothing if we don't do something about it. So number one, use your votes. If you know there's a candidate in your local government, your state government, your national government, and they're supporting Israel, think twice about voting for them. Because I don't want my money to go to a genocide and I don't want a political leader that doesn't align with my morals and values. And for me, that is in my top five. Maybe genocide doesn't make the list for some people, but mine does. Number two, vote with your dollars. We brought up BDS. I do 100% um, approve of it and support it. And we've seen change. Ben and Jerry's, I can't tell you how long I wanted to eat Ben and Jerry's, but I was boycotting them. So <laughs> I'm really glad that they um, are not supporting Israel or Israeli investments anymore. Um, another, there's a whole list. I actually have the website listed on the resource document. But Puma's on there, Ben and Jerry's was on there, Starbucks, um, HP. There's so many different things that we can do every day by not engaging and buying products. Money is power. And we saw apartheid fall in South Africa because they economically collapsed. They couldn't support the apartheid any longer. And the third thing is to take action. Not only educate yourself, but talk about it. I actually have um, a coworker. He's, he's actually much more senior than I am. He's the VP of our division, the vice president. And we got to talking about Palestine. And you know, he was born here in Utah. He's Caucasian. But um, I was really surprised he really listened to me and heard me out and did his research. And through that one person that I had a conversation with, who was willing to listen with an open mind and an open heart, he was able to talk to his family and change their mind about Palestine. So if you think you can't make a difference, please know you are so wrong. You can, your voice counts, it matters, and do not be silent. Without any justice, there is no peace. Um, lastly, I just want to take a moment of silence for all the people in Palestine who are currently being attacked and also for the people of Gaza as well. So if you could please join me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all. Two part question. Overview the United States been the primary supporter of the creation of the nation state of Israel since the end of World War II, 1947-48. The primary protector with regard to military aid. You know, Nora mentioned $1.3 billion a year. The, number, the United States gives about 1% of its over budget to foreign aid. Number one recipient is the nation state of Israel. In the United Nations, it was created in 1945. Ever since then, the number one protector of the nation state of Israel has been the United States in terms of the Security Council and its veto power. So today, who in the Congress, who in the Congress is speaking to the issues we're talking about today, showing leadership? I know about Congressman Levin being defeated in the primary, but who in leadership today in the House and the Senate? And also, Antony Blinken was just 
Secretary of State was just in the Middle East. And uh, could you update us as to what he has said when he was there this past month? Well, uh, I mean, the what's happened in recent years is that uh, the whole issue has gotten politicized uh, because uh, Israel had a far right-wing government uh, from 2009 uh, under Netanyahu, who aligned himself with the Republicans, and who even on the Iran nuclear deal went to make a speech before Congress uh, against Obama, which is just Talk about chutzpah. I mean, nobody's ever done that, a foreign leader like that, getting involved in internal American politics that way. And so the Democrats uh, have moved more in J Street's direction, uh, and that's why APAC is now fighting back as hard as it is. But many, you know, for the first time this year, Nancy Pelosi accepted uh, the J Street uh, endorsement. Uh, and many uh, Democrats, including senior Democrats, come to speak at the J Street conferences uh, that happen uh, in Washington uh, every year or so. The next one coming up uh, in December that I plan to attend, uh, where we bring thousands of you know uh, supporters. But still, it's nowhere near as big as APAC. APAC brings uh, you know probably five or ten times as many, and a key part of their base is now, as was mentioned, the Christian evangelicals. Uh, who have you know this bizarre apocalyptic vision where a war, uh, in their minds, is the way to go. That if you have a war in the Middle East uh, where you know Jews and Arabs will kill each other, that'll somehow bring the Messiah. <laughs> so, uh, and honestly, that's also uh, the ambition of uh, the right wingers in Israel on Iran. The reason why they wanted. <clears throat> to kill the Iran nuclear deal was so that the U.S. would be forced to into a war with Iran. And that's been Netanyahu's uh, goal. And that is, uh, uh, you know, we know how well that went with Iraq, right? And so this would just be repeating that um, and, you know, presumably equally disastrous. Um, so, I mean, the, the battle has really been within the Democratic Party, and there have been, uh, you know, more and more Democrats, and currently the number three Democrat, Clyburn, is in Israel with J Street on this tour uh, in uh, Israel and Palestine, um, which is, I think he may be the most senior uh, Democrat who's gone on one of J Street's tours. Uh, and, uh, you know, I mentioned Andy Levin, who led the sponsorship of the Two-State Solution Act. You can look up and see uh, the dozens of Democrats who co-sponsored that, and that might give you a sense of that. Um, the representative from Minnesota, whose name escapes me, who... Uh, <laughs> no, I don't mean slave. There, there's, she's from Michigan. Uh, but there is. I know, but I'm just saying, you know, the one Palestinian in Congress should be mentioned first, you know, and so yes, um, there, there is a. Uh, that, that's really all I wanted to say is that um, yes, there's there's people in Congress that we should be supporting, like AOC and Rashida Talib, Tlaib, that um, deserve our attention and. If we want to get involved, we should be going to her website and and looking at the Palestinian voice in Congress that is there, and uh, J Jewish Voice for Peace, along with our partners, um, our solidarity partners, uh, support her um, in many many ways, um, along with others. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Let's, um, I saw a hand up over there. <laughs> Um, I do have a question that I'd love to hear from all three of the panelists. Uh, of course, being a minister, my interest is spiritual and theological. Um, I did want to mention that it's, it's worth noting that today is a very sad day in the Jewish calendar as well as Tisha B'Av, which commemorates the destruction of the temple. And so I think there's a deep irony, a tragic irony, in the fact that Gaza is being bombed on this particular weekend of all weekends. It's just tragedy on tragedy on tragedy. And there's just no, it's, it is for us who are not Jewish or Palestinian 
to observe that with grief, but also I want to know what's giving you hope. And so from a theological point of view, I'd love to know from each of you, where is God for you in this situation? Or if that language doesn't work for you, what, what is your, how does your spiritual perspective uh, influence your work in this area? Thank you for the question. Just to circle back to the other one, Rashida Talib, I actually met her before she became a member of the house and she's absolutely amazing, please support her. Ilhan Omar, she is a strong supporter of Palestine as well. AOC was mentioned and representative Andre Carson of Indiana. So definitely support them. Um, for me, where is God in all of this? God actually is what gives me hope. We say Allah, but that's the same thing. It's just how you say it in Arabic. A lot of times people are like, so, like, who is your God? I'm like, it's the same as yours. <laughs> it's, it's God. <laughs> we just can't speak in English. So, um, for me, and in Islam, we believe that this world is a test. And we don't believe this world is the end. We do believe there is an afterlife. And that's what gives me hope as well, that this is not the injustice that Palestinians or anybody going through anything similar to it, that this is not their final time here. They will receive justice one way or another. If it's not in this world, it is in the afterlife. And I do believe that the tests in this world are for us and to give us a chance at free will. We, I believe and Muslims believe that and of course, Palestinians are also Christian, but um, I'm just speaking from a Palestinian Muslim perspective and my specific perspective. But um, we believe that life is a test and you have free will. You know what the rules are. You know what you can't do, whether it's something from gossiping and, and backbiting to murder of another person. So for me, this is the ultimate test for everyone, no matter what religion you are to see what you will decide and what you will support and what you will stand up for. So while I believe that God does not orchestrate the evil, because a lot of times people say, you know, like if there's a God, then why is this happening? I don't believe God orchestrates the evil, but he has given us free will to decide what we will do in circumstances. So that's what gives me hope is that we will receive justice in the next life. Thank you. Rabbi, do you want to go next? Yes, um, thank you so much. Um, you know, when people ask me um, what gives hope, I, you know, I've been doing this work for a long time. This coming year will be my 50th year serving as a rabbi. That's a long time. And also on this issue, which for me is interconnected with so many others. Um, I find hope in a community of activists. That's where I find hope. I find hope in the movement building. I find hope in the incredible hospitality that I've been shown um, by, by Palestinians um, on the ground and everywhere. I find hope in, in the power of nonviolence to create a transformative heart. I think for us, we must, whether, whether we sort of have hope or not, we are still obligated to do the work. It is, we are obligated to do the work in my tradition. And what, so we use our own spirituality, whatever our faith, uh, but set of our faith beliefs are, whether we are, whether we have a theology, whether we're more values based than theological, whatever that is that gives us personal strength, we are still obligated to do the work. And so I would say to you, Find your hope where you can and continue to do the work. Thank you. Um, you know, 
it's hard to find hope these days, honestly. Uh, it, it, we're not in a good period. Uh, you know, I, I often think of there as being two competing dynamics uh, in the Israel-Palestine conflict, the, the peace dynamic that you had mainly in the 1990s, you know, where people on both sides working toward peace and that creating its own positive dynamic but at the same time you had then and you have now the, the war dynamic where you know, there are people on each side who don't want peace uh, and who aim to genocide uh, the other side and have those aspirations. And you know, I see that those internal, it's very, I think it's very important to be aware of those internal divisions and the internal politics on each side. Uh, on my side, on the Jewish side, on the Israeli side, uh, it's a, a battle. Uh, between the right and the left, between those who want peace and uh, the absolute racist, genocidal, uh, horrific extremists who uh, want to continue the Nakba, who want to have another war with the Arab world so that they can use that as cover to expel uh, all the Palestinians uh, from uh, the West Bank and Gaza and from within Israel. Um, and we see that on the Palestinian side as well. Uh, the, the debate, the conflict between Hamas uh, and uh, the PLO, for example. Uh, in uh, Gaza, they support Hamas. They voted for Hamas. They've got Hamas now uh, leading them and focused on war and on investing billions of dollars in uh, missiles and mortars and, and, and conflict versus uh, the West Bank. They actually did polls because there was supposed to be a Palestinian election last year, which ended up getting canceled mainly because the PLO knew they were gonna lose. Uh, but in the West Bank, they were ahead in the polls. And in Gaza, uh, Hamas uh, is ahead in the polls. And there's a real internal division on the Palestinian side as well. Uh, and you know, it's really the responsibility of those of us who want peace, certainly on my side, uh, to condemn uh, the extremists on our side, the people who promote uh, the war dynamic. And I know on the Palestinian side, it's a similar uh, fight internally. And uh, the people who want peace often feel outnumbered uh, and in the minority uh, on their side of things. Um, but if anything gives me hope, uh, it would be uh, when I was in Israel uh, last summer, the summer of 2021, I went to the Dhaka Aviv uh, Film Festival, uh, documentary film festival in Tel Aviv, and I saw a film called Blue Box about uh, May, the, the Jewish National Fund. Uh, is this you know 100-year-old Jewish institution that's always been focused on raising money uh, to purchase land and to uh, promote uh, uh, the Jewish statehood. And uh, the great granddaughter of one of the top initial leaders of the JNF from the 1930s and 40s made a documentary about the role of the JNF in the Nakba, in the displacement of Palestinians, uh, which is ongoing. Uh, the JNF is now uh, uh, taking Palestinian land and displacing Palestinians in the West Bank. But this was the great granddaughter of one of those founders telling that story, story that the Jewish side in Israel never hears. And then we also had uh, at Sundance this year a film called Ten Torah. Uh, that was about, instead of sort of the macro level of major institutions spending money to displace Palestinians, this was one particular massacre carried out uh, by the Israeli army in 1948 of Palestinian villagers and then covering it up and uh, 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 keeping it from, you know, and, and making the documents uh, top secret for generations so that the word wouldn't come out. Well. This is a documentary now demonstrating that this happened. And uh, so when I see signs of that on both sides, uh, of Israelis, Jews coming to terms with uh, the terrible things that Israel has done to the Palestinians in the past, when I see efforts on the Palestinian side uh, to come to terms with the 
uh, genocidal statements and intentions made over the generations uh, going back 100 years by Palestinians and by the Arab side against the Jews and the idea of Jewish uh, uh, sovereignty. Um, I, that gives me hope that there are people who are willing to confront the most difficult aspects of their own history and willing to try to, and the director of this film, who again was the great granddaughter of the person who had done these terrible things uh, with this film Blue Box, she said, I don't know what the solution is, but until we come to terms with the reality of what happened, how can we even talk about a solution? So the fact that there are people on both sides willing to deal with the most difficult aspects of history on both sides, that gives me hope. All right, I just have to speak really quickly. So the way that it's being spoken about right now is that it's equal on both sides. It is not equal. It is not a conflict. They are under occupation. So no matter what's going on with the Palestinian side, whether it's Hamas, which is a straw man argument, and they have every right to defend themselves, look at our military. We have the biggest military in the world. Of course we're going to fight for our country and for our land. The Palestinians are no different. Just say, oh, Hamas, this, this, and this, or PLO, this, this, and this. Even if there are internal divisions, which there are, and there's drama, you know, wherever there's politics there's not everyone that's going to see eye to eye but I just feel very uncomfortable and it is very inaccurate to stay to state that oh once both sides acknowledge what they have done the Palestinians were already there there's already five percent Jewish population before the Zionists came there were Christians there were Muslims the Jews were not the problem and our land was taken so we are not the issue Israel the Zionists need to give back the land that was taken, and then there can be peace. And that is what gives me hope, is when we can actually say what happened. Now we're getting Excuse into- Excuse me, Michael. Excuse me, Michael. Thank you. Um, I just want to affirm uh, what Nora had to say, because um, I agree to, I am incredibly uncomfortable with the ongoing reference to this as a conflict. It is not when you are under occupation, <laughs> the conflict is brought to you. When bombs are dropping on your head, it's not a conflict. It's a war imposed upon you. And so this is not, we have to have a power dynamic here um, and understand that people who have been, who have, who are third generation refugees um, and not allowed to go anywhere in the world and whose water is running out and who have no food and have one doctor per 19,000 people, they are not, they are fighting for their lives. They have the right to resist. And even though I am personally someone who, who has been uh, trained and, and believes in nonviolence, I would never say that people don't have the right to fight for their lives. Um, so I think we should be clear on our language so that we don't further traumatize people who are <laughs> already traumatized. It's, it's sort of like accusing black people of racism, you know, or, or uh, it's just so distorted. So I, I just want to affirm that um, this is not a conflict between two sides. This is colonial settlerism supported by the biggest colonial settler, uh, uh, one of the, you know, the empire of the United States supported by the United States with, with $4 billion a year plus extra things, plus right-wing Christians giving tons of money to settlements and on and on. That is not equity. So where we need to find hope, yes, it's in the people who are reaching out to each other, and of course, and yes, to uh, and, and to be tolerant of, of people's different points of view, but to keep building the movement led by Palestinians, led by Palestinians. It is their lives on the line. Thank you. Thank you. In the interest of in the, in the interest of time, 
we need to adjourn to the coffee room next door where we can talk further. I have a question, please. I've been waiting patiently. Um, okay, I was going to say Matthew and Nora can be next door. Go ahead, Bernie. Thank you very much. I'm 81. I, I'm going to say goodbye, though, because... Um, I wish you would stay around, please. Just wait, I wish you would stay question. around, please. <laughs> I'm 81 years old, and I have been involved in a number of conversations about conflict. And I've heard about conflicts all my life. And this isn't the first one. We could have a, a meeting every Sunday afternoon for the next six months or next five years, and we'd have a different conflict every Sunday. And each conflict would have the same dialogue and the same conversation. Somebody would oppose something and somebody be for something. Somebody would be always right, somebody would be wrong. Be pointing the finger at each other all day long. I wear this t-shirt today. It's a BYU t-shirt in a liberal institution. We have our conflicts in Utah every day. We have a homeless problem we can't solve, and everybody claims that, no, young ladies, hang around, I listen to you, you listen to me. The, we have our conflicts that we can't resolve here locally, and we don't have a model. The problem is we don't have a model for resolving the conflicts. We have all kinds of conflicts, but we don't have a way of talking about resolving the conflicts that meet our needs, and this has gone on forever. So what I'm suggesting and asking you, do you really think the model that you're using for resolving this conflict is gonna resolve the conflict? Thank you for your question, Bernie. I have to completely disagree. This is not a conflict. Again, this is a genocide. And it is not the same thing if we talk about anywhere else. If we talked about Ukraine and Russia, we would be having a completely different conversation. But when it comes to Palestine and Israel, all of a sudden people say, it's a conflict, it's complicated, we don't really know, it's been going on forever. It's, I can tell you it's been going on for over 74 years. I can point to a date and time where it happened. So to say that is this gonna resolve anything is very pessimistic to me because we saw the Berlin Wall to go down and we should learn from history and not repeat it. So the way to resolve it is to have these types of hard conversations, be candid about what's going on, and also do something about it. Guess what, if we pull out the $1.3 billion at least that, we're down, that we are giving to Israel, we are paying for their free health care. Where is our free health care? Are Americans not first for that money? I don't care what your beliefs are, a holy war, oh, this needs to happen for the second coming. I don't believe any God believes in killing and murdering innocent men, women, and children to achieve a goal. And to say that this is just what it is and there is no resolution, I completely disagree with. There is a resolution. Pulling out the money, voting, voting with our dollars, and having these conversations and ensuring they never happen again. We saw apartheid fall in South Africa. We saw the Berlin Wall go down. There have been many things that have been resolved, but the issue is we want power, we want resources. This is the game of monopoly that we have to play on Earth, unfortunately. And well, until we change that, then there will be no permanent resolution, but there is resolution, if we want it. Matthew? I think, I think, Nora, that may be an accurate description of the current situation, uh, but if we don't know the history and if we're not honest with ourselves about the history, then I think we can't put ourselves in the shoes of the people living there in the conflict. Uh, and that means can being honest. Can you please stop referring to it as the conflict? No, I cannot. It, it is one of the worst conflicts in the world. It's one of the worst conflicts perhaps in human history. When Israel was created, uh, nobody predicted that Israel would be the winner. And when you go to Israelis and try, as I do, to make the case for coming to terms with the terrible things that Israel has done, what they say to me is, well, if the Palestinians had won, which everyone thought they would, and if the Arab world had won, which everyone thought they would, they would have done 10 times worse to us compared to what we've done to them. This is that what people 
have in their minds and in their hearts, and they have grounds for it. The Arab leaders, the Palestinian leaders, aligned with Hitler during World War II and the Holocaust. This is the historical record. They made all kinds of, expressed all sorts of genocidal aspirations at that time, and many continue to today, even in Hamas, while there's internal conflict within Hamas, and there are those who are more willing to make peace with Israel. There are others who quote the Quran to express genocidal intent toward the Jews, and this is part of the conflict. And if we're not honest about this, then we can't deal with it, and we can't put ourselves in their shoes, and we can't help them come to a resolution. Well, we knew this would be a controversial morning, and now we are going to have coffee and continue, but Mark needs to make an announcement first. Yeah, we just would like everyone to mark their calendar for next week. We're going to have a, um, a program about Unitarian youth and how uh, our uh, religion uh, stands up for Unitarian youth. So please come be a participant in, in that. Uh, we're going to have a QA. and a uh, It's presented, uh, the team leader on it is uh, Donnie Davis and her daughter Jenica da Davis Hokut is uh, a national Unitarian uh, representative specializing in Unitarian youth. So she knows what's going on and uh, it should be a real interesting conversation and we look forward to um, that as well. It'll be 10 o'clock here and on Zoom. So please uh, mark that down. Thank you. I just want to say, if any of you are interested in this topic that we've had today, talk to me during coffee hour, because I'm so far the only Unitarian that's involved with this, and I'd like company. So um, let's give our panel a hand.